Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Mindscape Podcast. I'm your host, Sean Carroll. Several years ago, when I wrote my book, The Big Picture, its idea was to describe and defend, articulate naturalism, right? The idea that the world is a fundamentally natural thing, no supernatural aspects or anything like that. And it's a weird task because you have to both say, well, here's what we have learned, here's what we know, but also... When it comes to the things we don't yet know, our best future understandings are continue to, going to continue to be naturalistic. And so that's the case that I tried to make. But as you might expect, within naturalism, people disagree with each other about very important things. So the particular line I took was that the universe, the physical world, it just is. You know, it exists, it obeys its rules, it has its stuff that obeys the laws of physics and so forth, but it doesn't judge you. It doesn't care. It doesn't evaluate you. This is a moral anti-realist position. There is no set of rules out there given to us by the universe that helps us differentiate between right and wrong, good and bad, things like that. The universe, in some sense, doesn't care about us human beings. But that's not a reason to be nihilistic or depressed or anything like that, because we human beings care about we human beings. So it's not that there is no such thing as right and wrong or meaning to life or anything like that. It's just that those things are invented by human beings, not handed to us either by the universe or by God or something outside the universe. So this particular point of view, which again is not necessarily uh, completely accepted, there are people who disagree, fits in very well with the tradition, not just of naturalism, but of humanism. Humanism, in some sense, it's the very old tradition of emphasizing human beings rather than the divine or something like that. It's not necessarily atheistic. You can be religious and humanist, but there's a sort of natural affinity if you don't believe in God for putting human beings at the center of of what does matter. You could also think that human beings are insignificant in the universe, and that would make you kind of non-humanist. But a humanist says, as far as evaluating what matters to human beings, where that evaluation comes from is also from human beings. So it's a fascinating history because it is not how human beings were thinking thousands of years ago. We were, in large extent, very supernaturalistic, right? Human beings 2,000 years ago were pretty prone to thinking that human beings themselves were not the source of meaning and mattering in the universe. That idea had to develop over the years through, at least in the West, through the Renaissance and the Enlightenment and so forth. In the East, around the world, there was, of course, different paths that were taken. And the history is always fascinating because these ideas don't spring fully formed in uh, their final form. They develop over time. So today's guest is Sarah Bakewell, who is a a journalist, writer, writer, scholar who thinks about the history of these things. In fact, if you liked our recent previous talk on existentialism with Sky Cleary, uh, Sarah is the author of a book called The Existentialist Cafe, which you could check out. But her new book is called Humanly Possible, 700 Years of Humanist Free Thinking, Inquiry, and Hope. So we talk about precisely this history of humanism, going back to the 1300s in Europe. You know, we touch a little bit about the ancient Greeks and India, China, and so forth, but really... Her story starts in the 1300s with literary humanism, Petrarch, Boccaccio, people like that, going up through a whole bunch of different strains of thought from, you know, Shakespeare to Voltaire, uh, Thomas Paine, and so forth, up to the current day, Zora Neale Hurston, Bertrand Russell, people like that, science, Darwin, Huxley, Um, how we should think about our place in the universe if the idea of a place in the universe is something that comes particularly from human beings. And where is the place for humanism right now? Is it important? Has it become the default? Is it being overly ignored? Is there a vital movement there? Um, What do we do if we think that humanism is important? Or if we don't, how do we combat it? That might be something some of you are thinking right now. But anyway, the history, one way or the other, no matter where you come down on these big issues, is a fascinating one. So let's go. (laughs) 
Sarah Bakewell, welcome to the Mindscape Podcast. Thanks very much. It's lovely to be here. So you've written a new book on um, the history of humanism. Why don't you tell us the title of the book exactly? It's uh, Humanly Possible, the title, and the subtitle is 700 Years of Humanist Free Thinking, Inquiry, and Hope. I like those. It's I like the theme of optimism that runs through the book as a characteristic feature of humanism. But of course, like this is one of those interviews where the first question to ask is just perfectly obvious. Namely, what do you mean humanism? What is it? What is the definition of that? I can imagine people disputing different possible definitions. It's very much disputed, and actually, the first line of the book is "What is humanism?" There you go. <laughs> and. Um, I'm actually quoting, and this is quite a good way into talking about that, I think. I'm quoting um, a comic novel by David Nobbs, who's a sort of English comic novelist best known for The Fall and Rise of Reginald Perrin. But this was um, a book which um, called Second from Last in the Sack Race, where he was kind of drawing on his own experiences of being at school. And he has this scene where, in this imaginary school, um, some students decide to set up a humanist society and they have their inaugural meeting. And of course, in the inaugural meeting, the, this is the first question they ask, what is humanism? To which it immediately degenerates into total chaos because they all have different ideas of what humanism is. So one of them says, you know, it's the Renaissance's attempt to escape from medieval scholasticism and the church and to... Um, you go back to sort of literary studies and uh, and free thinking, and then another one says, "Well, no, it's doesn't it mean like being kind and nice to people mm. and bandaging animals and things?" And another one says, "Well, that's not humanism. Humanism <laughs> is trying to live without belief in the supernatural and taking human life and human um, connections to each other as the basis of our morality." And um, to which the, the other one responds, but are you saying that it's not good to bandage animals and look after people and things? And it just goes on. But the thing is, they've actually nailed all of the main definitions of humanism there. And my starting point is, rather than saying, well, no, humanism is not that, it's this, I prefer to say, well, actually, it's all of those things. And they are all brought together by the word human that's at the center of the word humanism. So you have, for example, one of the the meanings that is very familiar, especially in the English speaking world in general, is this idea of living without um, the dogmas of religion and probably without religious faith, Sure, but at least without putting that centrally and um, very much foregrounding human relationships, moral obligation to each other, a sense of community and things like that as the basis of our morality. But, of course, there's this whole, I mean, at the other extreme of quite a range of meanings, it was used through much of history um, of this sort of Europe from really late medieval times through what we, the early modern era or the Renaissance, we might call it, to um, mean people who specialised in, uh, well, the humanities, and we still mm. call specialists mm. in the humanities humanists. Um they are the people who specialize in the human studies. So that means literature, the arts, culture, history, the historical understanding of things, a whole huge range of stuff to do with human culture. Um, and again, that it just has the sense of human at the center of it. So I think there's a fantastic range. And I really believe in, at least for me in my book, in trying to be inclusive in the, all these definitions to try and take the broadest, most connected um, sense of humanism that I can. Um, but there is still a core. There's definitely a core at the heart of it, and it's there in the word human. So you're you're not here to tell us what the once and for all right definition is, so much as to be inclusive and ecumenical about you know the, the positive aspects of all these definitions. I'm definitely looking for a, a rich sense. I think mm. all these meanings of humanism can enrich each other and, um, and really lead us to think about, well, what is the... Um, idea of the distinctively human cultural or ethical realm, which I think all these kinds of humanism have in common that they foreground that. So there's the physical world 
of course, there's the world that is studied by science. There's uh, the sort of physical reality of which we're a part, with that undeniably. And there may or may not be, according to some people's belief, a um, purely spiritual realm, a realm of gods and the transcendent abstractions, perhaps. And then there's the realm of culture, language, you know, songs, dances, stories, um, the many ways in which we respond to each other, educate each other, entertain each other, uh, have moral obligations to each other, the, the entire realm of culture. And humanists are definitely, I think, united by a, a real interest in that realm in, in all kinds of ways. And uh, so, yes, I, it only connect is my mm. motto. It's kind of, I try to look for connections because I think that's, um, well, for me at least, I, do, I find that so interesting. I think there's definitely been maybe a slight shift in the immediate connotation of the word. When we think about Renaissance humanists, it was more about thinking about human beings, uh, writing fiction and stories about them, uh, you know, center, centering the human experience. And maybe today there's more of a secularism, atheism, agnostic, agnosticism um, implication that comes along. Well, really, what I'm trying to do is to is to draw the connections between some of those things, and um, in fact, you know, it's even more the sort of the earliest meaning of the word in Italian "umanisti" was literally just based on those who teach and study the human studies, hmm. and what that meant actually was quite specific. It was things like grammar, um, eloquence, rhetoric. It was it was drawing on the classical Greek and Roman um, sense of what you needed for public life and to be a good person, and passing that down the generations of the... So, it, of course, it's come a very long way since since that meaning, but but each step of that, those transformations, I think, is, is connected. So, for example, those people, although they were fascinated by the humanities and by rhetoric, eloquence, and all the rest of it, they were also fascinated by the idea of moral um, revival on the basis of these ancient mm. sources of finding a better way to manage society, finding a better way for each of us to govern ourselves in our relationships with our communities, with our world. Um, so the, the moral meaning, the literary, if you like, meaning, and um, by extension, I think the, the secular meaning is there. Um, of course, they were certainly not unbelievers, most of those people, right. through most of European history, because that was very rare. I mean, to be an absolutely overt, outspoken, direct atheist was extremely rare. Yes. And there's a lot of debate about you know how rare it really was. But, um, but the emphasis was on the, um, the human world, the way in which we uh, manage society, as I say, you know, all of those sort of political, social and communicative skills, so literature, eloquence, and things like that, not on theology, which tended to be very much set apart. In fact, it was actually, um, people would say, well, I just speak of human things, and I leave divine things to the th theologians. So there was that separation of realms even then. I can I can relate one tiny relevant story here, which is that my wife, Jennifer Willette, uh, is a winner of the Humanists of the Year Award from the American Humanist Association. And when well, she got the notice, uh, she said, like, maybe they mean you <laughs> to me because I'm the more outspoken, you know, atheist secularist. But I thought it was brilliant because her life's work has been devoted to writing about science, but in a way that centers human beings and tells stories and, and relates right. it to us. And I thought that was an ideal example of, of humanism in action. So I, I thought that was a brilliant It is choice. absolutely. I mean, I think – and. You know, that's great that she, she got that award and that sounds like a very, very good reason for giving it. I mean, although I imagine the same thing could be said of you as well, that you, I know you could, great science communicator, science philosophy. I think um, I like to see that connection too, because as I say, on the one hand, there's, you know, you've got the realm of theology and the realm of the human, but the other great division in those kind of three parts is this idea of the realm of the physical world, the realm of science. And I think sometimes we're encouraged yes. to think that scientific thought is entirely set apart from human feelings, human thought, human 
responses to the world, ethics, values, all of that. Um, and I mean, I don't think it is. I'm not a relativist when it comes to science in the sense I don't feel like scientific method is somehow purely subjective. I think that's, I really don't agree with that. But but I think that um, our desire to use scientific method to explore the world, to explore the nature of the universe is itself very much a part of our humanity. Mm -hmm. What we are as human beings um, is is deeply bound up with our um, interest in science and our scientific instincts, if you like. So I love to see those potential gulfs being bridged. And uh, that's so, uh, yeah, brilliant. I, I do want to get to the actual history here, yes. but uh, maybe, maybe one more clarifying question would be, given all these wonderfully good aspects of humanism as you've laid them out, who would ever not be a humanist? Well, what does it mean to, who's the who's the other side? Who are the anti-humanists, both early and, and maybe today? They certainly are anti-humanists and always have been. And it's equally hard to define what that means too, because it does, I mean, it sounds like self-evidently a bad thing. And it's not, <laughs> it, it may not be, because actually quite often those might mm. be people who are reminding us not to be too vain about ourselves, not to be too carried away on saying humans are wonderful, which is something I don't think humanists do usually say, but there have been some who have um, expressed themselves in those terms, you know, humanists, how, how, what a piece of work is man, you know, how, how excellent we mm. are. Um, <laughs> well, you know, anti-humanists are there to say, hang on a minute, are you sure about that? <laughs> yeah. And um, right. I think also they um, they do sort of remind um, us of the of the less rational parts that you know we can't pride ourselves on being too rational, too good at getting on with each other in society. Let's you know remember that there are all these bad things that happen, um, and that we do. And so I think there's a really useful sort of constant response and interrelationship between humanism and anti-humanism. I think they they naturally tend to call each other up because as soon as somebody says anything strongly humanistic or anti-humanistic, it naturally calls up a response. But this is all part of what we always do as human beings, which is thinking about ourselves, trying to figure out what kind of creatures we are and how we should be living in this world. Um, so yeah, definitely. I think you can never have one without the other. And some humanists are more optimistic than others. Some are maybe naively so, and this is something that, again, the anti-humanists are there to remind us not to be naive. Um, but um, but not all, you know, a lot of humanists have had a much more nuanced uh, sense. And and to me, the my, my great case of that, and I, we might be jumping ahead of any kind of chronological sequence Please here, but, um, but is uh, Michel de Montaigne, who has, I've written a book about mm. him before, he's a great, uh, somebody I find endlessly fascinating as a writer, 16th century essayist. He was certainly a humanist in all kinds of ways. There's a literary, somebody who read deeply in in the literature of classical and contemporary authors who considered what he read, um, reinvented it kind of for his world. And, um, and he was a humanist in that he was fascinated by human life, by his own human character. He wrote about it all the time. But he is also... Um, he wrote pages and pages and pages on uh, how we shouldn't get up ourselves, basically, because we are <laughs> <laughs> do terrible, stupid things all the time. And the other animals are much better at um, all kinds of things than we are. And he draws on Plutarch, who who assembled a great mass of stories of uh, animals who build better. You know, birds build nests. They do a much better job of it than we ever do within our buildings and things like that. So, so Mon Montaigne is somebody who, to my mind, sums up that those two exactly that tension between humanism and anti-humanism. The tension between he is a humanist, but he's not always an optimistic one, and his right. it gives a much more nuanced view. And as you said, you know, especially back in those days, to be a humanist was not to be an atheist uh, in the way that we would recognize it right now. But but you also mentioned that there is a 
strain in religious thought, maybe not all religions or whatever, but there's a kind of religious thought that is deeply anti-humanist where they say the fundamental nature of humans is to be fallen, is to be sinners, is to be falling short, and we need to look outside humanity for salvation, right? I mean, am I correct in saying that that is more or less unambiguously not what a humanist would want yeah, to say? Yeah, I think that's pretty safe to say that's not a humanist view. And um, William James, who wrote the great varieties of religious experience, analyzing religion, lots of it from a psychological point of view, said um, that this, for him, this is the basic structure of religion. First, it tells us that there's something wrong with us, deeply wrong with us. Then it tells us mm. that this is the way to fix it. And it holds up the religious, well, dogma mm. or consolation or whatever you want to call it, or um, appeal to a higher authority. Um, I mean, I it may I'm I'm kind of unsure myself whether would it really be right to say that all religion has that. I'm not sure that I would say that, but you can certainly find it in in Christianity. Of course, if you go back to Saint Augustine, he invented the concept of original sin, and it's certainly yeah. there in original sin. I mean, that's what original sin is. Even newborn babies mm -hmm. are born wrong and need redemption from. The Jesus Christ and uh, and and from God, <laughs> um, I think that you know it, it's religion is. I mean, that's such a blanket term. There is so much going on in religion. There is a humanist oh, yeah. strand in religion. Um, a lot of people argue quite strongly for that. Others argue that no, that's kind of you know you can't really see that much humanism in religion, and it's a bit of an abuse of the term. I don't agree with with either extreme. You know, I think that religion tends towards a kind of more humanist strand when it really focuses on human well-being and life here on earth mm -hmm. amongst each other and what we can do for each other rather than um, this idea that there's something terribly wrong and that the main thing we have to do is pray to be redeemed from it. Okay, good. With all of that background <laughs> out of the way, thank you very much. Um, you know, I'm sure, I don't know whether you want to um, elaborate, but I'm sure there were precursors to what we think of as humanism in ancient Greece, in ancient China or India or, or elsewhere in the world. But arguably, your story starts in the 1300s in Italy. And, and so how did it start? Why did it start? What were they yeah, reacting against? I kind of started it there because it has to start somewhere. And it is quite a traditional place to start telling the story of humanism, um, and with good reason, because um, there was all sorts of what we could certainly regard as humanist activity going on before that, well through the previous centuries. But but what really changes in the 1300s among a small group of people is they start explicitly, explicitly thinking of themselves as recovering from some kind of dark age, a term which they mm -hmm. basically coin, in order to um, renew the modern world by reaching back to the lost or half lost or not quite lost writings of the ancients, meaning mostly Latin authors and also Greek authors, which they had great difficulty in reading still because very few people could read Greek. But they explicitly began, so I'm really talking about um, the the sort of the people that stand out in this story are uh, Petrarch, we always call him in English, Francesco Petrarch, mm -hmm. who was um, born in Italy and his family um, were sort of refugees from Florence uh, due to political upheaval there. Uh, they, he actually grew up in Avignon or just near Avignon in France where they had to flee mm. to. Um, and he devoted his life to literature, which he had to battle for a little bit because uh, his father, who was kind of basically a notary, expected his his son to follow into the legal world. Um, he didn't want to do that. He wanted to read and write and collect books. And that's exactly what he managed to do all his life. So he became... Some, some things never change. The, uh, I know. And I have a certain... Children not living up to the expectations of their parents is never going to go well, away. Well, that's it. I mean, you can rebel by sort of going out and and taking drugs or getting drunk or something, or you can rebel by going out and buying manuscripts of Cicero, <laughs> <laughs> which is what Petrarch did. And um, he managed to make quite a good life for himself by um, really working for patrons, which were sometimes 
involved with the church, sometimes uh, just sort of, you know, private nobility who really funded his activities. So he got to spend his time collecting what he could find. And this meant often going around monasteries, which did have fantastic mm. collections of books, often including secular works from um, the ancient world, or at least copied and handed down by generations of copyists from the ancient world. And um, so Petrarch sort of collected these, studied them, edited them, began all, again, it's back to the humanities, all the things that we now associate with the humanities, this uh, close work on texts and, uh, and, and generally literary and moral study and political. So, and the other one of that time that I do find a very sort of fascinating character is um, Giovanni Bocca Boccaccio, who was a friend, became a friend of Petra, slightly younger generation. And he too did the same thing, going around monasteries, digging up these manuscripts or, you know, sort of blagging his way into getting hold of them, doing copies of them, sharing them with, with friends and with Petra. It was kind of a bit of an industry, you know, it was tremendous energy that they put into it. But as I say, they, they really saw themselves as, as starting a new beginning. And, uh, and that makes them quite a good point to start in looking at that story of humanism. But they were also writers themselves. They weren't just collecting old manuscripts. So they oh, were, very much they were so. starting something new. Very much yeah. so. They wrote in almost every genre imaginable. I mean, Petrarch is remembered particularly for his sonnets uh, in poetry, but he wrote other kinds of poetry and lots of prose. And really my favorite um, writings of his were his letters to his friends, mm. which he then at a certain point in his life decided to collect and assemble into a volume and copy out and improve on a little bit. Quite a lot of uh, <laughs> you know, polishing up went on. Yeah. And then he made that into a sort of a, a collection which he then distributed uh, among his friends for their enjoyment and interest. Um, full of details of his life, his world, his concerns. Some of the letters were addressed to the ancient authors that he loved. So he'd write to them quite familiarly as if they were friends as well and sort of tell them off a bit you know, for doing things that they shouldn't have. <laughs> or, um, and Boccaccio also wrote a very wide range of stuff. We remember him mainly for the Decameron, which is this hundred tales um, of a tremendous range. Again, you know, a lot of them are quite bawdy and just good fun, uh, um, romps really, and others are really quite serious and they're meant to be taken as moral lessons. So he's showing off the range of what he can do. And so what made uh, those two figures and their contemporaries specifically humanist in your view? Well, it is, it is the way that they saw themselves as um, recovering the past and through these manuscripts, this manuscript hunting, this reading of the ancient authors, recovering the past and then reinventing it, reinvigorating it for a new generation. So there was there was certainly that sense of hope in the future. Not much hope in their present. It was very difficult to because they lived in mm. a very difficult time. The, the 14th century was really a terrible time in, in much of Europe, not least because the plague spread through all those areas in the middle of their lives. And uh, it was devastating, absolutely devastating to people's right. sense of, of security in life, as well as just literally devastating to many cities and populations. So um, tough times, but they, you know, and they saw themselves as using the power of literature, the power of these ancient arts of good government and good speaking, good writing, beautiful um, eloquence in writing and speech, using those as a, as a way of renewing uh, human life. It's interesting that you mentioned the plague because it obviously was, you know, on everyone's mind at the time. And, and whenever we talk about grand historical shifts in how people think and talk and, and what have you, I'm, I'm fascinated by do the ideas themselves lead to these shifts or are there external factors that nudge them along? I mean, in the case of the 1300s, on the one hand, it's the end of the Dark Ages, the beginning of the Renaissance. At the other hand, it's the end of the Islamic Golden Age uh, in, in a world where exactly. the Islamic world was tightly interacting with the European world at the time. So do, do you 
give credit mostly to you know the thinkers and their ideas here, or were there external conditions that help explain why it was then and there? I think it's happened? tremendously complex, and I also think that the point that you're making is also absolutely essential as a reminder that this whole idea of there being a dark ages or some sort of you know terrible time before the Renaissance brought light to anything is a very Eurocentric idea because it only mm. makes sense from the point of view of mainly of Western Europe. Um, so, and in fact, it, you know, it, it's not an idea that really stands up to a lot of scrutiny as, as is always the case with these pretty sweeping characterizations of particular eras as being one thing or another, because they're always vastly more complex in the, the chain of cause and effect, the relationships of different cultures to each other, the cross fertilization of cultures. Um, all of this was was going on and um, was very, it, there's definitely no one simple story. Um, you know, you don't, I mean, in a way, I sort of take Petrarch and Boccaccio in their own sense of themselves, but not uncritically, you know, I think that uh, we can look at them under all sorts of different lights and see a whole load of factors that went into what made up their world. It does seem that one little bit of technology was absolutely crucial was simply books, right? I mean, we, we had books for a long time, but the idea of sharing texts back and forth was, you know, it's not it was it wasn't the ver their version of social media, but it did it, it was absolutely necessary to make well, these shifts happen. Even more specifically, a, a crucial thing was the arrival of paper technology in Europe. They'd had it, of course, in China for much longer. Um, before that, they had to use parchment made from, um, you know, calf skin and uh, the skin of other animals. Tremendously expensive and labour intensive to um, to manufacture. I mean, you could hardly call it manufacture. It was a terribly painstaking process, and of course, that material was so valuable that quite often, in order to have a fresh bit of parchment for writing or copying some new text in the monasteries and their scriptoria, they would scrub off an old piece of writing in order to get themselves a, a piece of parchment that they could <laughs> reuse. And that process right. certainly contributed to our loss of quite a few texts, especially if they felt that they wanted to write something sacred and that it was better to scrub off an old bit of uh, something from the classical world pre-Christian, which didn't mention, you know, Pagan. it wasn't in line with it. Right. Um, I think that that can be exaggerated in the sense of, yeah, these monasteries did also actually preserve those pre-Christian texts and um, often did a very good job of it. But, you know, definitely, yeah, there was an element of, uh, we desperately need parchment, which of these precious things are we going to erase in order to have it? So paper was, of course, paper was brilliant. It was much, much cheaper and more readily available. And when these first stirrings of humanism arose, uh, we're, we're in a very deeply religious culture at the time. Was there backlash or did people even realize that, oh, this was going to go bad places <laughs> in terms of the established uh, religious Almost hierarchy? Almost never, because it, usually it wasn't really um, any kind of direct challenge to Christianity at all. I mean, it was taking place. A lot of these people worked for the church. They were part of the, hmm. uh, especially in Rome, but also elsewhere. They often were associated in some way. They often had taken orders in, in one way, though, because the church was such a center of intellectual activity. There was, it wasn't really much choice, but they probably, you know, you don't get the sense that they did it particularly reluctantly. I mean, it just wasn't there. But there are some exceptions where people did write things which antagonized the church greatly or challenged the church's claim to authority. And one of my favorite of the humanists, this is into the 15th century now, so it's uh, later than Petro sure. and Boccaccio, was Lorenzo Valla, who wrote a fantastic total um, takedown of this bogus document that was called The Donation of Constantine, which oh, supposedly yeah. recorded this moment when the Emperor Constantine um, signed a document um, bequeathing to the popes, the Pope and all their successors, control over the whole of the Western Empire, really, 
Italy and all sorts of other lands all over Western Europe. Um, and in fact, it was a total fabrication. It had been, you know, put together um, years after it was supposed to be. And Valla used these humanistic skills to expose the fraud. He um, particularly used, he was a philologist, so he was a, an expert in um, the Latin and also Greek. His Greek was very good. Um, but he used his knowledge of Latin not just as a timeless thing, but Latin as, as a language that had evolved and been used differently in later medieval times from the way that it had been used in early um, medieval times, in the fourth century when it was supposedly written, um, to point mm. out that it couldn't possibly have been written then because the words that were used <laughs> just weren't, they weren't used at that time. And uh, there were all sorts of clues in the text which he pointed out saying, well, this document is not what it's claimed to be. And that, therefore, of course, was a big challenge to the church's claim over all the territory that it said it had been basically right. bequeathed forever. So, I mean, in some sense, can we look at that as almost a precursor to science and a sort of a new way of thinking in the sense that it's not pure logic or rationalism in the old sense, nor is it revelation or anything like that. It's looking at the evidence, comparing uh, different hypotheses and seeing yeah, where it takes Yeah, it's definitely you. using those tools. And it's kind of using, but it's, it's using literary tools. So it's using knowledge of language, cultural tools, um, more than study of the natural worlds, but certainly it's, it's using them in a way that points out um, contradictions. It points out I think that, I mean, of course, medieval scholastic intellectuals did, they did point out contradictions. They did have a very good knowledge of, of uh, language. What's new is this sense of a historical way of looking at um, what has come down to us. So thinking historically, thinking this text has come from somewhere and what has gone into it? How was it made? Who made it and why? Hmm. And we're seeing really the beginning, almost less of science, I'd say we're seeing, seeing the real beginning of history, of historians in the modern sense. Okay. And um, certainly of, of that kind of critical history, that, um, that history that investigates the evidence and foregrounds the evidence and then asks, well, what is the hypothesis here? What's likely, what's not likely? I'm, I'm very happy to count history as a subset of science, so that's, oh, <laughs> that's sure. completely yeah. compatible with me. But it, it also points to another kind of big deal at that time. You've already mentioned books and paper, but also education reform, right? Different ways of uh, organizing the curriculum and different ways of, of teaching sure. things. The birth of a university may be part of this whole story. Yeah, again, that sort of goes back to an earlier era, that's for sure, um, the university, but um, and also, of course, very much drew on the Arabic world. That, mm -hmm. that was really where that began. Um, but it's what's new again in the education is is this idea of um, being educated for a good life, being educated for to be a good human being, to be a, um, a fully uh, realized human being, and somebody who's able to take up their place in society. Because of course, it was mostly the elite and almost entirely men who were being educated in this way, um, and they were being educated to to become wise princes and heads of um, whatever it was that they were going to be called on to do. So perhaps working in the city administration. Um, it's actually very similar to the uh, the training of the civil service um, people that was going, that went on in much earlier time in China, which is a lot of Confucian writing mm -hmm. is, um, is very much focused on, you know, how do you learn it's not just about learning the various rules and and how to use the bureaucratic documents. And although that was a large part of their training, it went on for years and years and years. It's about um, how do you become a good person? Because if you're a good ruler, other people, the, the people below you, sort of in the community, will will want to emulate you, and they'll become better, and everybody will be better off. And um, you know the. Cultivating humanity, they have this word uh, "ren," um, which means humanity, conscience, 
being a good person, there's a, there's a huge range of meanings in, in that word. And there's really the same thing um, can be found in a lot of the writings of the humanists of the Renaissance, and they in turn are drawing on the uh, writings of the Roman world, which also stressed, and the Greeks as well, who also stressed virtue, being a good person. So this becomes at the centre of education, um, public life, and uh, humanity, human virtue. At the risk of maybe being parochial and too much caught up in my own time, is there a worry that we're losing that conception of education, that uh, modern universities and high schools, for that matter, are focused on giving technical skills to students and less focused on turning them into good human beings? Well, definitely where we start to see that concern um, absolutely sort of being expressed all over the place is in the 19th century um, and even actually the late 18th century, um, you start getting philosophers of education and public commentators of all sorts saying, we're just teaching skills. We're just teaching, mm. um, we're teaching people, training them for jobs and careers maybe, but it's in a very fragmented way. There's no, what we're not doing is train, training people to be whole human beings. And they're fascinated by wholeness in that time, like complete fulfillment development, wholeness as a human being, that's what education should be doing primarily. Um, and also doing it amid a fair bit of freedom that pe the students should, it should come from within them. They shouldn't just be drummed in with mm. skills and skill sets and bits of knowledge. They should be encouraged. The job of an educator is to, literally the meaning of educate is to draw out, to lead out what's in the student, you know, what's in the person um, as they develop. It's a eh, ducare, uh, which is like sort of duce, actually, funnily enough, uh. in Italian. It's that same meaning, which means, you know, to um, to lead. And you're sort of leading out, so you're, helping, you're leading out what's in the student. So that I knew sort of concern about, um, you know, fragmentary education or education that is simply skills-based, simply... Uh, education for a purpose of churning out people who can do whatever's required of them in society, rather than um, encouraging people as they grow up to develop into fully realized human beings, fully integrated right. human beings, rich with a rich interior life as well, and, and, and able to play a really valuable role in society. That became the, the new ideal. And I think, we, but that was drawing on the ideas of the early humanists. So there's a real chain of um, inspiration going between those those different centuries. We're definitely still talking about the same issues today, absolutely. <laughs> and as always, there's no real right answer because, <laughs> I mean, there are criticisms that could be made of this Renaissance ideal of the humanistic education because for starters, it was definitely for an elite who were expected to govern. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, we actually see quite... That is still going on in the modern world. I mean, there's this sort of ox. There's a kind of Oxford uh, University um, path that is a bit infamous here in the UK because it's this is where so many um, in the government and uh, often perhaps people who are sort of maintaining they have those skills. They have a certain polish. They they can sling around Latin quotations, um, but do they? How much do they really know about the struggles of ordinary people? So there's a there's there's, a, there's still that tension, there's still that debate that's that's going through to do to do with elitism, to, to do mm -hmm. with the question of elitism. And related to that is again going back to that Renaissance education. Very few women got it. There were a few. Um, Queen Elizabeth the first was a prime example of that. So that She's pretty good at it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, she got a great education. She also you know, was um, kind of insisted on it herself, I think, but she did get a good education. Now, that was actually largely because she was destined to govern. She was expected right. to govern, so she needed that training in how to do it. So, yeah, oh, yeah but I most think this women is... didn't have that at all because they were, they were not expected to have any kind of public life. They were expected to live a purely private life in the family. This is in danger of being a whole other podcast uh, topic, but it's so fascinating to me. I don't want to let it go quite yet. I mean, as you're pointing out, the ideal of a humanistic education, uh, a full one, a broad one, 
um, it, it's very interesting because I never really, it never really dwelled on the fact that it was meant for prospective leaders, right? It was obviously for an elite. It was for a tiny number of people, and in particular, the ones who were going to be leaders. And so that was the justification for why you would have this broad education. Yeah. And today, we have more of an ideal of universal education, uh, and we put less emphasis on the broadly humanistic aspects of it. But so, so maybe there's a gap there that uh, remains to be filled where people make the strong argument for why every person deserves a broad humanistic education. Yeah, and also another thing I'd add to that is that um, it didn't really include anything that we would call science. It didn't include, it. arguably, and I think this has been argued, they got a more kind of scientific education in under medieval scholasticism than they did under the humanistic ideal because that was very focused on good government, good literary skills, and all the rest of it. Mm -hmm. There really wasn't much science at all. Of course, science as we know it now didn't exist yet, but yeah, there wasn't there wasn't what we would now call science really, just was pretty absent. And it was in the 19th century again where educators started to say, well, Maybe it's more useful. The most important thing is to give everybody a good grounding in scientific thought. And that means not just the actual, you know, knowledge of science, but how to think yeah. scientifically, how to ask questions scientifically, how to test hypotheses, how to um you know, that's those are great thinking skills. And some of them reacted against that humanistic education by saying, Well, it's just to I mean, what's the point of learning Latin and ancient Greek when you could be learning about the physical world that's all around us? And uh, of course, I mean, I think, as always, I'm inclined to say, well, why can't we have it all? Yeah, yeah. there's room for <laughs> both here. <laughs> okay, uh, sorry for that digression, but I, I do think it, it's important. But Let's, uh, since we're trying to squeeze many centuries of human development into a tiny amount of time, um, take us from the Renaissance to the Enlightenment, which when I was a kid, I always used to think that they were the same thing, but they're clearly very, very different things. Um, but the, the humanist strand continues through there. It does. And there's a whole kind of meandering. I mean, there's, there's a, there are periods between those two, which are very interesting as well. But I do think it's, it's. I do quite sort of think jumping to the Enlightenment is not a bad idea because that's when you start to see, certainly you start to see the rise of scientific thinking. Um, so we're talking 18th century. There's a kind of long Enlightenment that's that sometimes mm. is traced back to the 17th century um, and various philosophers and scientists, of course, very much that were beginning to you know, revolutionized science in that era. But the height of it was the 18th century. And one strand is is using reason, using scientific method, being having a great belief in the power of that. Um, but the thing that I think is specifically humanistic about that is that it's having a belief in the power of that to improve human lives, to improve human well-being. And the fact that they wanted to foreground that question of human well-being so um, one of the figures that leaps out in that is is Voltaire, a great mm -hmm. figure of the Enlightenment, who um, really believed that um, it's we should do everything that that we can to um, instead of sort of trying to find ways of justifying by reference to some divine principle um, the fact of human suffering. Um, we should actually do what we can to, of course, you can never banish human suffering at all, but um, to reduce it and mm. to minimize, to make it a little bit less widespread than it is, or to provide ways um, of of sort of, well, yeah, just making the bee less suffering. He um, was very uh, famously very uh, shocked by the um, earthquake. This is, you know, sort of the earthquake in Lisbon of 1755, which um, shocked a lot of people around <laughs> Europe in uh, physically, <laughs> yeah, of course. But uh, I mean, it actually was felt as far afield as like Sweden and Scotland. They could they could feel this earthquake from Portugal. Of course, the destruction in Lisbon and around it was absolutely horrific, and so many people died either instantly or because of the fires and. Uh, just civic breakdown that that followed, 
Um, Voltaire was wrote several things, most famously Candide, his little, um, it's a sort of fable, but um, he also wrote a poem about it and he wrote uh, entries in his philosophical dictionary about uh, about this question of when terrible things happen. And he took aim at this um, justification that was um, put forward by the philosopher Leibniz, but you know it was sort of cited by in other contexts as well. This idea that, um, well, it's often quoted as "all is for the best in the best of, in the best of all possible worlds." The idea behind it was that, well, clearly God, um, he could have made a, there not be an earthquake. He didn't, but since God is benevolent, and since you know, I'm sure he would have stopped it if he could. Clearly he can't. Clearly there's some very good reason that only God knows about, which yeah. means that a world in which that earthquake didn't happen would be somehow worse. And far be it from us as mere human beings <laughs> to um, dispute that. You know, and Clearly something's going on that's far above us and we couldn't possibly understand. So it's this um, justifying the ways of God to man. It's this referring of, we, should, we just have to accept, we just have to refer it upwards. Well, I mean, Voltaire was very annoyed by that attitude because he said, well, whether that's true or not, first of all, we've got a perfect right to bewail our fate and, and complain and, and gnash our teeth at, at the sufferings that we undergo in life. Um, and secondly, why not actually do something practical to make it um, just a, yeah, less likely to happen, less disruptive when these things happen? We can't stop earthquakes, but um, as we've improved on vastly since then. There's a lot that can be done to build to a, a higher quality so that buildings don't fall down so much, um, to uh, provide better civic management, actually, which is vital, of course, in the aftermath of disaster. And since long after Voltaire, we've sort of developed a certain ability to see earthquakes coming. As we know, none of this works um, always. Mm. At still, mm. horror, absolute horrors happen. Um, but the, it was later called meliorism. Um, this actually wasn't a term of Voltaire's or anything. It was apparently the novelist George Eliot was the first or possibly the second actually to use, to be quoted as using this term. It just means we can make things a bit better. You know, yeah. we can't solve, we can't make a perfect world. We can't solve everything. We can use our ingenuity, our technology, our political skills, our management of situations, our ability to predict things, we can use those to make things a little bit better. And I think that idea is, to me, is one of the, it, it's the humanist idea at the heart of a lot of what happened in the Enlightenment. So the Enlightenment's often been seen largely in terms of people adulating the idea of reason and being besotted by the idea that we can be reasonable. But I think a lot of Enlightenment thinkers actually were just saying, let's just try to be more reasonable. <laughs> than we currently are, because it improves human life if we do. Uh, I like the idea that plagues and earthquakes play such a large role in the flourishing of humanism uh, throughout history. But Yeah, so it's supposed to be such a cheerful philosophy. It's supposed it? to be. It's just a chapter of disasters. But it actually, it, it makes sense upon reflection because I would take part of humanism to sort of, like you just said, accept the responsibility of trying to make things better. You know, an anti-humanist or non-humanist philosophy can kind of offload that to, if not explicitly God, to destiny, to providence, to fate, or whatever it is. Whereas a humanist has got to say, well, look, there's randomness, but we still have to do the best we can in the face of that. That's absolutely right. That idea of responsibility, taking responsibility for ourselves collectively and individually. I mean, you know, that there are disasters. There will always be disasters, but it's really up to us to uh, try and respond to these in, in a way that's as helpful as possible. Um, you can sort of start to see the connections with the, the worldview that doesn't put divine order at the center of things, the worldview that starts to put human, not only well-being, but also actually human decision-making, human... Um, action and responsible choices at the heart of things instead from our point of view. Um, the, you know, 
the realm in which some sort of divine battle between God or Satan, for example, might be going on. It's like, well, maybe it is, maybe it isn't. It really doesn't have much to do with us <laughs> on a day-to-day -day basis. We have to um, think about ways to build better buildings so they don't fall down, so on right. and so Yeah. And this was the period when you said earlier, you know, about the Renaissance humanists, none of them were loudly, explicitly atheists. But now in the 18th century, we, we begin to get some loud, explicit atheists. Uh, Voltaire was not one, as far as I can tell. That's um, right. Mm -hmm. And and you, you give a lot of prominence to David Hume, one of my favorite philosophers. Who you referred and he was, uh, yeah. Yeah, you referred to him as I merciless. Think, uh, but there's a, there's a, an anecdote, I'm not, I'm not sure if it's true or not, of uh, Hume visiting the salons of Paris and, and saying something like, uh, none of us here is, is you know, explicitly atheist. And, and all of his hosts are like, no, we all are, except for you. <laughs> except for you. <laughs> well, how did we that transition happen? Yeah. yeah. There was a, um, a f philosophy that came to be called deism, um, which provided a very good cover for any atheist who wanted to cover because it basically said exactly that, that, um, you know, there probably is a God. We're not saying there's not a God, you know, there's yeah. the, the deity. Um, but he just, he or it or whatever doesn't enter into everyday human life. There's no direct, everything in the natural world and in our lives goes on separately from that. And so, of course, if you're an atheist, but you don't want to say so because being explicitly atheist was quite dangerous still. It really was very dangerous. Um, so it could get you into all sorts of trouble if you directly challenged the idea of there being a god at all. But you could just set that aside and then go on to talk about human life as if God had everything connected with, with that yeah. sort of transcendent realm was completely irrelevant. Of course, I, I don't think that all of the people that we think of as deists were simply using it as a cover. The problem is that we just can't really know. It's terribly difficult to know because obviously, if they didn't record that in their writings, then you know they're not going to write down on a piece of paper. Well, I'm pretending to be a deist, but really I'm an atheist, <laughs> or very, very rarely. Yeah. Um, but there is some where we we do have a a pretty good inkling. I mean, um, another great Enlightenment philosopher and thinker, um, Diderot, Denis Diderot, was probably. I mean, it gives quite a lot of sign of probably being an atheist. Um, he had to bury or leave unpublished a lot of his writings where that was suggested. And as I say, David Hume, who, you know, did make it about as explicit as you could, um, but even <laughs> then not entirely. But, you know, he was known in, he lived in Edinburgh, and he was known as the great infidel and the great atheist, so he, he had a reputation. But there was a, nevertheless a looming blind spot, which of course you're going to talk about, which is that even the people who would have identified as humanists would narrowly define humanity, the part of humanity that deserves the right and respect, the rights and respect uh, that, that everyone should get, white, male, certain age, certain proclivities, et cetera. And you know, it took people who were not in those categories to raise their hand and say, wait a minute, you know, we're human beings too. That's, that's an important uh, story in the history of humanism. Absolutely. Mm. Yeah, and that um, is, I mean, the Enlightenment is particularly uh, ambiguous in that regard because some of the apparently most um, critically minded and rational and, uh, you know, sort of, you would expect better of them, frankly, um, <laughs> Enlightenment thinkers were perfectly capable of saying that, of course, this didn't apply to, and then there's a whole list of, yeah. you know, sort of colonized peoples or, um, people of African origin or anybody basically who wasn't uh, of European origin. Um, and of course, women are the great, you know, just half the human race is absolutely left out of it for much of it. But what you begin to see is people who are, say, black women, for example, starting to say, well, there's us, okay, you know, there's, <laughs> we're human too. Yeah. Um, but often they use, and where I find it particularly interesting is where they use the some of the tools of humanistic thought or enlightenment thought precisely to um, think critically about the received idea that women don't really count and to start to, to investigate mm -hmm. that and to query it. And they do it on the basis of a lot of humanistic philosophy. So somebody like Mary Wollstonecraft 
author of, of Indication of the Rights of Women in the late 18th century, um, used the kind of the same critical thinking about you know, how did things come to be this way? That, for example, I was talking about Lorenzo Valla, who who used the sort of historical thought, and she does the same. It's like, well, what if you might think that women seem a bit vapid and they are uneducated <laughs> and they're they lack confidence. Well, think about why are they uneducated? It's because you haven't given them an education. You know, why do they lack confidence? It's because they're constantly told that they should be modest and um, retiring and that they shouldn't express their opinions. And so it's starting to think in a kind of um, genealogical way or a historical way about, you know, why is this? So there's that. And another humanistic strand, I think, is starting to appeal to an idea of there being something, a kind of, I mean, the phrase of it, dignity is often used in the context of um, the dignity of, of human rights or the dignity of, of human essence somehow, that we all, all of us have um, an essential uh, dignity, an essential humanity, which for all, however diverse our many aspects of our lives are, there's also something that we all share, which is our humanity. And um, nobody should be seen as having any less of that than anybody else. And um, so then you sort of start to see this argument Coming, which will end with things like the Declaration of Human Rights, where that's right. a central idea in the mid twentieth century. Um, but it, it's feminists and mm -hmm. um, you know, all kinds of other voices are starting to come in and say um, there is an essential humanity. So you can't. Mary Wollstonecraft says you can't talk about there being particularly female virtues, for example, and and male and and then not even male virtues, but kind of human <laughs> virtues. So of course, yes, <laughs> like human virtues. And then there's the particular ones that women are supposed to have, which just happen to be all very negative. So it's all like modesty, um, it, you know, sort of silence, um, not talking too much, <laughs> yeah, all the rest of it. Um, but there are, you know, she says it's not, we all have or should have human virtues. We should all be educated to have human, we're human if you're human beings, your virtues are human virtues. And the total sum of, of the virtues of, Humanity include the traditional female ones and the traditional male ones. So it's um, this is a, these are all very humanistic concerns. The humanists had always been very interested in the question of what makes a good human being. What is it to be virtuous? What um, what's needed in the public realm in terms of um, training people to be good, training people to be completely um, to be knowledgeable, to be eloquent, to be able to take part in decision making in society, all of these things are starting to be brought up in the context of um, not being exclusive. So there's less and less of, of the idea of the human as something exclusive and um, and more inclusive. It's certainly not a straightforward story because mm. there's a tremendous amount of backwards and forwards, there's, there's, con there's confusions, there's inconsistencies. You get somebody might be very good at arguing for for women, but actually hopeless on questions of race and, you know, so oh, yeah. it, it's a tremendously complicated process. Um, and, you know, it's not just like one smooth progress, that's for sure. But what is being seen as a, is a great sort of diversifying of, of the whole humanist picture, which is still going on today because we're still, Very much, you know, of course, sure. this is a, a never ending, um, dull, you know, it's not, there, there is, there's no point where you can say, well, we've arrived, we've sorted out the whole problem of of exclusion. I mean, of course not. You know. One of the stories in your book that I really liked, uh, which was not quite contemporary, but I think anything that happens after I'm born is is the modern world. So um, Mary Whitehouse was a uh, you know, conservative British activist, and uh, she argued against what she called the humanist gay lobby. And as you point out, there wasn't any humanist gay lobby, but once she started complaining about it, uh, a bunch of people got together and started one because that sounded like a really good idea. <laughs> exactly, yes. And it's, and, and it's now, you know, affiliated with the, the that organization is now affiliated with Humanists UK. And um, I was told uh, that they took the slogan, born of Mary, because they <laughs> were born out of, you know, this... Uh, this this case that was brought against uh, the magazine Gay News by Mary Whitehouse, for, and that was um, in the sixties. 
70? No, no, it was, uh, yes, hang on, it was, I'm trying to remember, actually, I've forgotten it. No, it was the 70s, 70s. but I think okay, it was yeah. 73 or something, yeah. It's yeah, like, oh, right, living, it's, it's early 70s, Living yeah. memory anyway. Early to mid 70s. Okay, oh, I so, I mean, yeah, again, we're still trying to compress a lot of human history here. So we've uh, we've become enlightened, we've liberated different parts of the world, uh, different segments of humanity. In some sense, you know, if you would just tell the story of the 20th century, the political story, you know, there's these wars and, you know, both the World Wars and the Cold War. Uh, can we think of fascism, Nazism, Stalinism in some sense as fundamentally anti-humanist movements, but in a kind of a different way because they're sort of val valorizing the state or the system uh, rather than the individual human being? Yeah, well, I think that's absolutely right. That's exactly what makes them anti-humanist because it's it has the same structure in a way. There's something wrong with, um, like deeply wrong, not just details that are wrong. There's something profoundly out of kilter about human life as we find it. Yeah. Um, what's needed is a strong authoritative other thing. And that thing might be in, in communism, of course, it's, you know, the Marxist dialectic, the dictatorship of the proletariat. This is, it's an abstract. It's an abstraction. It's a theory that's going to revolutionise human life and make us into these sort of this shining light of the of the post revolutionary world where everybody is um, fulfilled and nobody is alienated anymore. Everybody. Will. And of course, the reality turns out to be quite the opposite of that. So yeah, inevitably, because it's it's imposing a an, ab an abstract idea, isn't it? Imposing the state again, the state is what guarantees all of that. So the state is being set up as um, having an absolute authority over individual choices. I mean, you can't, if you're part of a revolutionary state, you, you can't just live your little individual choices. That can't be tolerated because everything must be subordinated to this goal. And of course, in Nazism, what you've got, and fascism of all kinds, you've got the nation playing that role. You've got national destiny. Um, plus, you've got the figure of the dictator. So you've got Mussolini, we've got Hitler being, you know, sort of playing that absolute role. Individual freedom, individual choices, individual responsibility, the kind of humanist basis for morality that relies on our fellow feeling, our empathy, or our sense of responsibility to other people. All of that goes because it's all to be subordinated to the needs of the state. Um, profoundly anti-humanistic, I think, those movements. So yeah. how, I guess we didn't say this explicitly, how crucial is the idea of individualism to humanism? I mean, I could imagine claiming that I'm a humanist, but being a humanist who uh, puts front and center some group of human beings rather than individual human beings. Yeah, I, individualism is a problematic concept because it's, can also be associated with this um, idea of in, of individual self-assertion. Mm. You know, this the justification of of I mean, I think it was sort of Ayn Rand mm -hmm. um, idea that uh, the an individual who or a kind of Nietzsche and Superman Ubermensch that can um, just assert themselves and and uh, have everything they want. So it's a kind of neoliberalism in in the market idea that this basically might is right. Well, um, definitely that kind of individualism would would not be particularly humanistic, I think. Um, and individualism in itself is a very, when you sort of go back through the, the centuries in history, it becomes very hard to talk about individualism. It's a very modern concept that doesn't always make a lot of sense when you're talking about um, different historical times. When does it really arise? I think it's a sort of a concept of the, of the individual is... Well, it becomes a very 19th century concept and um, liberal philosophy. There are several liberal thinkers who were deeply humanistic because they did think about the individual, but they also thought about it in the context of um, be, having a sort of um, the well-being of all and at heart. So it's if individual people are basically the state steps out of their lives as much as is possible, except to prevent them harming each other, so right. to, to, pre to prevent abuses, that's the role of the state, is to prevent um, anybody's freedom being brutally curtailed by somebody else's. But within that, basically, people should be able to develop as they want to by having 
running their personal lives the way that they want to, as long as they don't harm anybody else. You know, this is the central idea I think of of liberalism, mm-hmm. which is which is very humanistic. So, I mean, to say that all it, humanism is individualistic, I think, is not is just not quite right because it's kind of it blurs some of the historical developments, and it also gets dangerously mixed up with this. Um, rather arrogant idea of the individual as being able to do whatever they like, which is t- totally inconsistent with with the humanist idea that we um, are basically sort of res- morally responsible to each other, that we have a um, responsibility to our, the people that we live among, and not only people, but also to other animals, to the rest of the natural world, to to you know the, the very foundations of life. Um, so, yeah. It's complicated, as with so many things, it ends up being it's complicated. Is the answer? It is. It is complicated, but I think that I think you put your finger on something that does make sense to me. The idea that what we think of as classical liberalism emphasizes the individual and their rights and their flourishing, whereas the humanist tradition has individuals as very important, but cares a lot about helping other individuals. I mean, you, you mentioned the E.M. Forrester quote of only connect, you know, it's individuals matter, yeah. but not in the sense that they matter individually, <laughs> but as, you know, the object yeah. of our care. Well, really, uh, if I had to say what is my favorite quote from the, um, well, I'll tell you what, actually, favorite two quotes, I think, from the whole of humanist thought. One is um, from Terence, the, the um, Afro- um, Roman playwright of the ancient world who who said a very famous line of, I am human, I consider nothing human alien to me. Mm. Um, we're all connected. The other one that I was originally going to say was um, uh, from the 19th century free thinker Robert G. Ingersoll. Apparently it was pronounced Ingersoll, not Ingersoll, okay. because his enemies used to call him <laughs> Ingersoll because he was injuring people's <laughs> souls apparently by, by going around preaching a secularist free thinking uh, message. Uh, preaching, perhaps not the right word there, but you know. <laughs> and um, and he came up with what he called the happiness credo. It was his belief um, about how to be happy. And he said, the time to be happy is now. The place to be happy is here. Well, he started it, happiness is the only good. The time to be happy is now. The place to be happy is here. And the way to be happy is to make others mm. so. Can't leave out and that think, last line. You know, if you're in, yeah, exactly. It all goes together. It's 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 Happiness is for this world, not for some imagined paradise um, mm. beyond. Um, it's the here and now, but it's, uh, yeah, the path to happiness lies through being connected to each other and loving human being alien to us. So let's just leap up to the present day now. Uh, we're in a situation where, okay, we've in some sense won the battles against fascism and Stalinism and so <laughs> forth. <laughs> I hope so, Maybe. but I'm not sure. Uh, yeah, I, I know, I wonder. know. I should, I, I, even as I spoke those words, I was kept bringing them back. But there's a different frontier. Uh, people now talk about transhumanism and posthumanism. There's a technological frontier, um, uploading ourselves into the matrix, uh, frolicking in virtual reality. Do do you see these technological advances as tools to further the humanist cause or potential challenges to them? I think that at the moment, it's of course, it's all very theoretical at the moment. I mean, we're dealing with um, the arrival, the imminence and arrival in many ways of of artificial intelligence, things that are not human, but uh, Mm. you know, have some kind of intelligence. This is something we're going to have to wrestle with for sure um, in relation to what it is to be a human being and what humans need, um, as opposed to what machines might need. Um, but that, it, this sort of wilder shores of transhumanism, the idea that we will merge with machine intelligence or with a kind of abstract um, spiritual or intellectual mentalism in, in the universe, not need bodies anymore. Um, it's always, a, yeah, I find it kind of fun and fascinating as an idea. But I think that it misses so much about what it is to be human. And this is where humanism is there to remind us that being human, of course, it's a bodily thing, but it's it's also we're connected to our societies that we grow up in, the people that we know, the people that we live among, and to all the details of, of our cultural lives as a the whole planet. You know, we have this tremendous cultural inheritance from each other, from all the 
things that have happened in the past, books that people have written, the art, music, everything else, that is the, you know, this tremendous humanistic realm of, of human culture um, and the, just the details of our everyday lives. All of that, I mean, it's as if this transhumanist idea treats all of that as being something that could just be cast aside and then there would be a pure human essence of some sort that could just float about in a purely mental realm um, as an abstraction. Yeah. And I think that there's something that is um, really sad about that, I now feel. I mean, I used to feel that that was quite exciting when I used to read science fiction. I, mean, I still do read science fiction. I love it. But it, it's it's that particular idea used to seem like, wow, you know, cosmic, transcendent. <laughs> you know, who wouldn't want to be have a mind that's basically... Yeah almost identical with the whole universe. Um, and now I think, well, yeah, but what about all the things I love? What about reading Petrarch's letters? What about, you know, sort of looking at, at artworks? What about um, just, you know, sort of having a cup of tea with my yeah. wife or patting the dog? And uh, I mean, all of that, so those sort of the texture of of life, the, uh, the intertwined nature of our reality with each other and with the particulars of the planet that we live on um, is is sort of treated as just dispensable. And I think that there's something, you're kind of talking again about something rather similar to this idea that all of the detail of um, this life is something in the old kind of idea of the religious, um, the, the totally dedicated religious life would be that you set aside all of that as, you know, don't enjoy it, don't... <laughs> <laughs> enjoy eating, drinking, listening to music, or whatever it may be, because you should always just be thinking about the paradise that lies beyond. And you see a very similar structure, really, in some of this transhumanist dream that it's all of that detail doesn't matter. There's going to be something better. Yeah, I think I, and I'm, that's not humanist. Yeah, I'm extremely sympathetic here, and uh, you know, to wind things up, maybe I don't even have a question, but let me just say some things that 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 what you just said uh, sparks in my brain, and you, you can respond to it. Uh, because you know, to be more specific, you, you mentioned the science fictional ways of thinking. You mentioned in the book particularly Arthur C. Clarke's Childhood's End, where you know the human beings are visited by aliens and ultimately they all sort of transcend into this higher realm. Um, and it's not that different than a lot of ideas about joining the matrix and, and you know being free of our yeah. bodily wants. And it's not that different from classical views of heaven, right? Where we get a reward and in, in, there's words about eternity and infinity and things like that. And what I feel about these is that they really neglect the crucial central point about being human, which is our finitude and the struggles, the embodiment that we have in the world and just the need to be fed and to walk and to touch and to be sad sometimes. And I, I, I struggle myself because I want to be open to new things and better things, and I don't know what they would be like, but I do feel like, like you just said, that some of this narrative is just glossing over what makes us us, and it wouldn't be as, as good as people are imagining. I mean, it would be good in a different way, perhaps even, but it would be a good in a way that is no longer recognizably human, I think, that with the loss of all that, um, to which, as I say, I, I would also add our social mm. nature. We're extremely social animals. We have, um, I mean, we are nothing without our, our, it's very hard to imagine a life completely separated from any kind of social contact. Sure. You, know, you just wouldn't even know where to start with, with that idea of what that would be like, um, especially if you're talking about from childhood from the beginning. I mean, we're formed by our social contact. Um, how could, if you sort of imagine something better that somehow leaves all that behind. You know, it's there was this um, strand in medieval thinking, some of the more extreme uh, theological writings of, uh, of, of the um, sort of, well, various times in, the, in medieval writing that, that wrestled with the problem of, okay, you live a good life and you go to heaven. What about your relatives and beloved ones and children or whatever who have not had a good life and they're going to hell. How are you supposed to feel about that? <laughs> um, and some some people even said, 
Well, actually, it's it's fine because you'll be so transformed when you go to heaven that you'll be able to sort of lean over, as it were, and look down on them in hell and just watch them with total detachment or even pleasure um, as if you're just sort of, you watch them writhe around in the fires of hell and you can even take pleasure in it because you will be so changed. Oh. And I think that really um, touches on this issue with the transhumanist idea is that we will be so changed that we won't miss yeah. all of our, you know, the people we love because we're going to be, you know, sort of this transcendent thing. I'm always suspicious of, of anything that promises any kind of transcendent uh, reality. Well, maybe then the lesson is that whether it's uh, education or liberation or technology, there's more need for top flight humanism than ever before. <laughs> uh, that would be, yep, yeah, I hope so. I hope there's going to be a tremendous call for humanists all over every level of society. And so maybe that is a bit optimistic. We can be, be optimistic. Nice, That's okay. It's the end of the podcast is the time to be optimistic. <laughs> so Sarah Bakewell, thanks so much for being on the Mindscape podcast. Thank you very much indeed. I've really enjoyed it.